What does Jesus say about his future? That's what we're going to find out today in John 12. Well, I spoiler alerted the last time I told you something was about to happen, and now we see it. Six days before Passover, Jesus comes to Bethany. Lazarus was there. Yay, Lazarus. They have dinner for him. Martha serves, of course, because Martha is always serving dinner. And Lazarus is reclining at the table because that's how we eat. We recline at tables. Mary took a pound of expensive ointment made of pure nard. This is from India. This is not something found in the Holy Land area at all. So she paid big price for this, anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped it with her hair. It says the whole house was filled with the fragrance. Doesn't say if it was good or not. I don't know if it was good. I was just watching The Chosen that just covered this particular topic and people were kind of, oh, like, boy, that's strong. But Judas was upset about this. Why wasn't this sold? Why wasn't this given to the poor? He didn't care about the poor. He was, in fact, stealing money for himself. Someone called his stealing of money from the treasury of the apostles. He was probably setting some money aside. So when he takes off, he has something to live on. Jesus says, leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. The poor will always be with you. You won't have me for that long. Jesus has concern for the poor. He always has. He talks about the poor quite a bit. But in this particular case, his time on earth is very short and he is preparing for his burial. So this is fine. This is fine. Special things can have special gestures. And that's what this is in this case. What's interesting about this, broke up the top top of the jar and she wiped his feet with her with her hair. In Judaism, this would have been terrible. One, if you're going to get your feet washed by someone, it is going to be the lowliest slave, not the, you know, the woman of the house. <laughs> then it, the, to have a woman touch his feet like that, women were not supposed to touch other men. Using her hair, which a lot of people I've seen, and, and this is absolutely true, called the crowning of a woman, the crown of her. Women were oftentimes hiding their hair unless it was their husbands to, who could see their hair. People still do that today. To sit there and display her hair and wipe Jesus' feet with it, people would have been very upset with this because it just breaks every protocol. And so, of course, we're going to see that that's the case. And so when the large crowd of Jews learned that Jesus was there and you know came to see him, who he raised from the dead, the chief priest decided to put Lazarus to death too. I mean, didn't that guy go through enough already? He already died once and now we're going to put him to death again because, well, the easiest way to prove that someone didn't raise someone from the dead is just to kill the person you raised from the dead. So then Jesus on the next day heard that the feast is going to be Passover, was coming to Jerusalem, took branches and palms. So then the crowd heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. Of course, it was going to be Passover feast palm branches out and cried out, Hosanna, Lord, save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. You know, and Jesus was riding in on a donkey. This was something that was steeped in prophecy. First of all, he came in on a donkey and not as a king comes in like on a horse. But this was part of prophecy coming from Zechariah 9.9. We talked about this in the Synoptic Gospels too. But people are putting down cloaks and palms. This is how you greet a coming king. This is going to be the crowd that is asking Jesus to save them. I'm sure they want to be saved from the Romans. They thought this kingdom is coming to a point. Jesus is entering the city and he is going to retake the city from the oppressive Romans. I think even from maybe the oppressive temple structure. Jesus spoke out more about the temple structure than he ever did the Romans. So I think. They are just looking for freedom. They're looking for liberation from what's going on. What they're going to get liberation from is a spiritual death. And what they're going to get is Jesus, the king of heaven, his kingdom come. It says the disciples just didn't understand any of this. But it said that when they saw that Jesus was being glorified, they said, oh, you know what? This is all the stuff that Jesus has been talking about, has been written about, he's been telling us about. And when Lazarus came out of the tomb, they, they, Jesus said, oh, yeah, we're doing this as a sign. The word gets out. 
Bethany is not far away. And with all those people in Jerusalem, people are going to get the word. Does that now some Greeks came to see Jesus and asked Philip and Andrew, and they went to Jesus. And say, hey, you know, there's a whole crowd coming here to see you. And he says, you know what? The hour has come. Doesn't mean the hour, hour. It means the time. Now is the time. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. What good, you know, is a grain of wheat? It, but it will bear much fruit in the ground. Whoever loves his life will lose it, and whoever hates his life will keep it. Anyone who serves me must follow me, walk in my footsteps, and that footsteps are about to take up the cross and die. Where I am, my servants will be, and if anyone serves me, my father will honor him. This is a prophecy. This is talking about what's coming up. It's important to go through this. And like I said, we could spend eons talking about a single chapter. But in this case, we'll try to summarize what's going on here. When you think about a grain and you put a seed in the ground and it grows. When I was reading this and my friend and I went hiking, I saw this perfect dandelion. And it made me think that dandelion was a yellow flower, right? This is going to be the worst analogy you hear all day. And it eventually turns into the poofy type of dandelion, which means the flower died. And now it is just exposing the seeds. A big wind comes. All the seeds are going to fly everywhere. Flowers have to die in order to produce their next generation of flowers. Jesus is saying in order for the wheat to produce its next generation, it has to die. And all of you who are going to follow in my footsteps is going to happen to you too. But he says his soul is troubled. And what do I say? Father, save me. Save me from this hour. Again, not a little hour, but this time. But that's the purpose. I came for this entire purpose, which is what is going to happen next. And to do this, to, to glorify his father. And then it says a voice comes and says, I glorified it and I will glorify it again. And the crowd stood there and some people thought they heard an angel. Whoa, was that an angel? You know, people who see the spiritual and everything. And then some people thought it was a thunder and that it was storming. They couldn't even hear the voice of God calling out. So we hear people who overhear it and we we hear people who misjudged it. And then we hear people who just heard uh, something just rumbled. You know, there was a noise in the background. Jesus says, you know, this voice comes for your sake, not mine. Listen to this voice because I'm not doing this for me. It is all for you. And now is the judgment of the world. The ruler of this world will be cast out. And when I am lifted up from earth, I will draw all people to myself. This is going to be one of those uh, time tracking things. The ruler world not yet cast out, but this is the very first step to casting out Satan from this world. And when he is raised up to the cross, He's raised up to heaven. That is when he's going to draw everyone to himself. He's going to bring everyone in. It says, in the, and John says, this is, he did this so that everyone understood what kind of death he's going to face. But how can this be, the crowd says? You know, we've heard the Messiah is going to last forever. How can you say you're going to be lifted up? Who is the Son of Man? Who is the Messiah? You know what? The light is with you for only a little while longer. Jesus is the light. He was the light from the very beginning. We heard all of this. And while you have the light, walk in the light. Don't let darkness take you. The one who walks in darkness does not know where he's going. This is not talking about Satan at this point, but the people who walk in darkness. We talked about why it is good to walk in the light, because you can see God more clearly. You can see yourself more clearly. You can see your situation and other people more clearly. When you're in the dark, you don't know where you're going. And if you have the light, believe in the light so that you too may become the sons of light. Remember, we talked about that in other gospels, about how Jesus is telling other people are going to become the light. But when Jesus said these things, he departed and hid himself. And they still didn't believe him because of all the signs he created. He talked about the words of, Pro of Isaiah, all of this, all these things that he's doing as part of the prophets about people being believing in him, but they couldn't believe, their eyes were blinded, they didn't see. I would heal them, I would show them myself, but their eyes are blinded and they don't understand it with their hearts at all. Isaiah saw all these things, spoke of him, and even though all these people believe in Isaiah, 
studied Isaiah, they just don't even get it, the Pharisees in particular. I think that's why Jesus is so much harder on the Pharisees than the Sadducees, they didn't believe in the prophets. They only believed in very small parts of the Bible. Reminds me today where there are people who believe in God, but they only really believe in very tiny spots of it. They're, they even will call it the red letter Bible. Oh, we just believe in what Jesus says. Well, you know what? Jesus says a lot of things that they don't believe in either. But their belief is limited because they only believe so much of God's word. The Pharisees at least study the whole thing. They can see this better than anyone and they don't. And this was told by Isaiah that they're going to be blinded. And so people ask the question, well, why is God saying that he is blinding people? These people want to be blinded. That is their whole point. They want to be blinded. They don't want to see God. They have a hostile opinion of God. They don't want to be there and they don't want to see any of it. And so God essentially is, I guess, in a sense, answering their prayers. This is what they wanted. They want to not see God. They're not seeing God. Reminds me of like some discussion talking about heaven. Why doesn't God bring everybody to heaven? And someone said, well, that would be hostage taking. You lived a life that you don't want to be anywhere near God. You don't believe in God. You don't want God to have control over your afterlife. That's giving you what you want. You wanted this. He's not taking you hostage when you said, I don't want this. And in this case, these people don't want to believe in Jesus. Their eyes are turned away. Their hearts are turned away. They don't get any of it. They got what they asked for. They're getting the exact attitude they wanted to have. But even then, many leaders did believe them. So whatever is happening with the Jewish leadership, they still could have believed. They still could follow Jesus. And many of them did. We know uh, many of them did. And we'll hear more about some of them coming up. But they didn't want to face this uh, accusation from their reputation. They didn't want to be excommunicated from the temple because they cared more about what people thought of them than this. And I think they're going to come to a big reckoning when Jesus dies because their cowardice, their lack of standing up for things. Obviously, Jesus was going to do this, but they could have been someone who followed Jesus, who did the things, took up their cross and followed Jesus, and instead they were afraid. Then Jesus cries out, whoever believes in me, believes not in me, but the one who sent me, believes in my Father, right? Because the Jews, again, believed in God the Father. They missed the part of the Holy Spirit. They missed the part of the Son, the Messiah, the suffering servant who is going to be the Son of God coming to save his people. Okay, so you don't believe in me, but you believe in God the Father. Tell you what, whoever believes me, believes in God the Father. Whoever sees me, sees my God, the Father, and I've come into the world for the light. So people won't remain in darkness. They'll be able to hear my words and see what's going on and not reject them. He didn't come to judge the world, but to save it. The whole point of Jesus is not to send people to hell, not to toss out people, not to have them have their eyes shielded from the light. But you know what? Those who rejected me does not receive my word as me as a judge. The word that I have spoken to you will judge him on the last day. So for anyone who doesn't believe, you're going to be judged by that word, by Jesus. I'm not speaking out on my authority, but the Father who sent me a commandment, what to say, what to speak. I know his commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as a father has told me. This is all ESV. He is just telling the one-mindedness, the, the words that are coming from God the Father, he's doing his bidding. And if you believe in God the Father, you would believe in me. And if you believe in me, you believe in God the Father. We are saying the same message. Wow. So what I'm going to meditate on are people who are like the people mentioned in Isaiah, who heard but didn't believe. Eyes were blinded and their hearts were hardened. We have seen so many people get healed by Jesus resurrected by Jesus. Death cannot overcome him. Blindness cannot stop him from healing people. He can overcome blindness. But these people pick blindness for themselves. You know, wow. And I pray that I may never be so blind to my own opinions that I constantly reject what God has given me. I avert my eyes. I harden my heart. I reject everything that he stands for 
because I want to listen to the things I want to listen to. And what I'm going to share with others is the fact that Jesus came into this world with people cheering for him, putting down their cloaks. Some of the people who were yelling Hosanna just a few time periods before are going to be the very same people calling for his crucifixion in a couple of days. People are fickle and they have to keep their eyes focused on Jesus, look into the light and stay away from that darkness. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember, I have other podcasts. You can find them all at abetterlifeinsmallsteps.com. And anything you want to ask me, you can just email me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com. Have a great day. 